All right, today's presentation is on managing direct and indirect costs, and of course this drills down to the uh, GSA Bulletin FMRB 38 uh, indirect costs in motor vehicle operations and activity-based costing. All right, what this session covers, uh, of course, is the FMRB 38 that I mentioned on the introduction slide. And also we're going to talk about activity-based costing, or some of you know it as ABC analysis. And basically an ABC is a little bit more thorough in that it determines uh, ways to improve your fleet management and your operating costs. Uh, again, that's another cover slide. But the uh, background for this is uh, indirect costs have to be reported in the Federal Automotive Statistical Tool. And of course, I know many of you uh, just finished up around December 17th getting all your data in so that uh, GSA uh, can start reviewing it uh, in your FAST. And I know that's very laborious, very time consuming, but it's a very important process. Uh, the bottom line is costs have been un underreported uh, and, and reported inconsistently. So some folks who have a fleet management information system are using that FMS or possibly if it's just a fleet lease drive through, you should be getting some very good data. But even with those with FMIS and the other types of uh, reporting uh, tools, they're not capturing all their indirect costs. Uh, there was a 2013 GAO uh, audit uh, that uh, recommended GSA publish additional guidance, and so therefore that's why the B38 was issued. And uh, what that is, is provides an estimate, identification, categorization, and reporting of indirect costs. And uh, if you have not read this uh, FMR, I suggest you go to the GSA website, pull it up, review it, because if you don't have a way to capture these costs, they do provide a dollar figure for you. Uh, an excerpt from the GAO report was none of the agencies are reviewed, and they reviewed some major departments and agencies here, captured in their fleet management information systems all of the data elements recommended by GSA. And the types of data missing most frequently was data on fleet costs, including the indirect costs such as salaries of personnel with fleet-related duties. Uh, a lot of folks don't realize that a fleet manager's uh, salary and uh, overhead is an indirect cost, just as utilities is, just like the facility uh, uh, maintenance costs or the cost of the lease of the facility would be. Uh, key aspects of indirect costs, <coughs> as GSA defines them as costs that cannot be ascribed to any particular vehicle or class of vehicles. And this is just not an uncommon definition used strictly by GSA. This is a definition that's used widely across uh, most vehicle, motor vehicle fleet organizations or folks that are managing them. Uh, some of the examples of indirect costs include, of course, personnel costs. I talked about that somewhat. Uh, office supplies, the building rental, utility costs, computer, networking costs. Uh, the uh, maintenance on the uh, buildings is another thing to consider in there. And the bottom line is the failure to include them will distort a fleet's actual cost. I know it says can, but it will. And what that results in, especially within the federal fleet community, is tremendous underreporting of the total cost of the fleet. Uh, and of course, distorted costs undermine the accuracy of cost-based policy decisions. And this is not only in your FAST report, but when you're doing your A11 uh, around the August time frame, when you're firming up what the budget is for your fleet in the upcoming years, uh, you need to have this data, and it needs to be accurate. And so what are the recommended actions for this? Uh, first, you should establish an improved means of collecting and reporting these indirect costs, or you utilize the uh, B38, which gives you standard indirect cost factors for overhead costs if, uh, if the actual data is not available. Uh, this method is intended to be an interim solution. So in other words, when GSA put this out, they put it out because they knew that most folks do not have a means of capturing this data, but it was not meant to be a long-term solution, but more to bridge the gap until you got it right. And so that's why it says the expectations that agencies will pursue the first course of action. Now, with the new VLD data, which we're going to get into here in a minute, or vehicle-level data uh, that's going to have to be reported starting this year, uh, you're going to have to have an FMIS, and you should be capturing this data by the line item. 
Okay, what are direct costs? Direct costs are those items that are directly affected by the operation of vehicles and often vary with utilizations. And again, the direct cost is something you can put to a specific vehicle. I'll give you an example. You have a bulk oil supply in a garage. If you have a means of measuring that oil as it's going into a particular vehicle, then you're going to call that a direct cost and you're going to measure it directly into it. However, if you do not have a means of tracking that, then it would become an indirect cost. And so it can be a little confusing at times. Uh, direct costs, they can be either fixed or variable. Fixed in your monthly lease rate, insurance, uh, if you should uh, have it. And you say, well, we're government, we don't uh, buy insurance. Well, yes, you do. If you have vehicles going into Mexico, into Canada, or some other foreign country, you're going to have to have some type of insurance on that vehicle. They don't recognize the government is self-insuring itself. So, uh, you have the variable part, which is fuel and maintenance. Okay, okay and examples of direct costs, of course, is capitalized value, depreciation. Uh, that is something if you're not capturing depreciation on your vehicle, especially on your own fleet. GSA fleet lease, you don't worry about it. Commercial lease, you don't worry about it. But for the own fleet, you should be capturing depreciation. Uh, the amortization and disposal proceeds. So why are disposal proceeds important? It's because once you have costed out or depreciated that vehicle, when you capture back the proceeds from the disposal, it reduces the depreciation over that term. So it's a way of capturing back the money. Vehicle modifications and accessory equipment are direct cost fuel. You can isolate that strictly to one particular vehicle. Uh, any repairs or unscheduled maintenance, your PMs or preventative maintenance, uh, commercial lease costs, and of course the GSA fleet leasing rates, and that is by the vehicle or class of vehicles that you're that you're leasing. Okay, identification of Indirect cost. Okay, indirect costs are related to fleet operation that cannot be attributed to a specific class of vehicles. Unlike direct costs, uh, which can be either variable or fixed, indirect costs are almost always considered fixed or sunk. And again, uh, when we uh, talk about that, we talk about the indirect costs being facilities, utilities, computer, uh, the overhead for the supervision, uh, mechanics or shop personnel, uh, you should be able to break those down and have direct costs on those. So they would not necessarily be considered indirect unless they had training. If they had training that you put a mechanic through, then that would be considered an indirect cost. Okay, some more examples of indirect costs, of course, facilities, uh, and that's amortized facilities costs, lease costs, utilities. You can see the equipment here, and that's basically all the equipment and the tools that's needed to run the shop. Uh, any types of miscellaneous supplies, again, supplies that cannot be attributed to a particular vehicle is considered an indirect cost. Staffing, uh, this is your overhead I was talking about. And then, of course, the administrative overhead, and that's the cost of all the administrative support offices that may be attributed to the fleet, and as I mentioned a minute ago, the training. And these are just some of the categories, not all, that would be considered an indirect cost. What are the challenges in indirect cost uh, identification and reporting? Uh, well, first off, you know, costs can be uh, diffused across several programs, projects, or accounts. And so you say, well, how can that be? Well, you might have a vehicle that's used by multiples of programs. And so those indirect costs could be spread across, and so the tough part here is going and capturing those uh, costs across the various programs you may be managing. Uh, indirect cost accounting requires additional effort above and beyond basic accounting. And again, that's because it is so spread out, uh, oftentimes it is hidden, and so it takes a lot of detective work in order to capture all those indirect costs. The agency FMIS may not be configured to support indirect cost accounting. And what I will tell you is most of the federal FMISs that are currently deployed uh, do not capture all the indirect costs. And that is a challenge that uh, many of the agencies and departments are going to have in the upcoming year and our contractors who are operating the, the federal fleet because with the vehicle line item data, they're going to be required to report this starting this coming year. Should be capturing it already. Willie, we may have a question from the floor. Just one moment. Okay. 
Um, Patrick, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, Willie, this is Pat McConnell, GSA. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of indirect costs for facilities, do you have a suggestion on how um, agencies could uh, segregate their facility costs from um, the larger organizations? Like, like if a, the fleet person or office shares space with you know three or four other offices, you know, how, how do they divide up that cost or identify it? Okay, you know, it's an ac excellent question, Patrick, and, and, and it makes perfect sense. Basically, what Patrick is saying is, I have a garage out here, but oh, by the way, this garage is only using two-thirds of the building. The other third of the building is being used by this program and that program. So how do I know what part of that building is included in my direct cost? So this is what you're going to do. You First off, you're going to go to your environmental office within the... Uh, the installation, the organization, wherever you may be, and they should be able to break out or prorate the utilities for that building, okay? Telling you a good estimation what your piece of it would be. Secondly, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your facilities office. In your facilities office, if it's a lease facility, they'll know exactly what it is. They can prorate it by square foot to give you an idea of what their cost is. If it is an owned uh, building, then the facility people should be able to tell you what the cost of that building was, or if it is already paid for, what the depreciation on that vehicle or vehicle that uh, building is, and they should be able to give you what the cost of that facility is. So again, it's your environmental people to get your utility costs, and you're going to go to your facility people to get facility costs. Now for your computer support, because the computer support may very well be shared across all of them. In other words, the internet, the landlines coming in and things like that, uh, what you're going to do is go to your CIO shop, and they should be able to break out what it is. And this all drills down again to figuring out exactly what your indirect and direct costs are. And if these people, they're in the business business, they should be able to provide you a very good, uh, I'm going to say guess, and that if they don't have something more, more firm on it, uh, what those costs are. And that's what I would recommend, Patrick. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Oh, all right, thank you. Really, one more just for the good of the group. Um, a quick correction on the slide. The email address for vehicle policy should be vehicle dot policy instead of hyphen. So just a quick note for those who are who are taking notes here. Thanks. Okay, and, and thank you very much. And I tell you folks, uh, anytime you have a question about your fleet, be it owned, be at least. That is the email you need to go to. You have some really great folks, and that's the Officer Group Wide Policy, your email in there. When you send that in, and again, that's vehicle.policy, not dash policy. Uh, and typically, you're going to get Patrick McConnell, who just uh, raised his hand and spoke about the uh, uh, indirect cost, or Connie Aaron. Um, and they will be able to provide any answers that, uh, that you may be looking for. So that is the email address you need. Okay. Uh, the GSA standard indirect cost factors, again, this is from FMR B38. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was derived from the five year average of uh, 09 to 13 of indirect costs that reported uh, in FAST by the agencies. And uh, agencies can, uh, that cannot report their costs should use $468 per vehicle per year or 7.5% of the total cost, excluding. The indirects. In other words, if you're going to use 468 or you're going to use 7.5, you should not have any costs already entered in indirect. And then, of course, you only update as needed. But this, again, is a uh, bridge gap measure. This is not intended uh, to give you a pass for not capturing the information, but rather to give you something that will get you into the ballpark of what you should be reporting per vehicle per year. Uh, for your indirect cost. All right, I mentioned a little bit ago <clears throat> about the new FAST vehicle line item data reporting. I think most of you are very familiar with this. If you're not, uh, you need to get on, on the train. The train's left the station. And uh, folks, uh, you're going to have to report this in the next FAST uh, session that comes open uh, towards the end of this year. And so uh, let's just give an example right here of one of the elements. Uh, this is a business rule. 
uh, that that has to do um, with uh, 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 indirect costs. Okay, uh, of course, the first block here is an uh, enter. It should be a number. If you don't enter a number in there, a numeric value, it's going to block you. Uh, the minimum value can be a 10. Uh, anything uh, less than that, you're going to get blocked, whereas the maximum value is 2,000 uh, for the indirect cost. And if you'll see right down here in the last two lines, uh, what they're using right here for this figure is 10% of the GSA guideline for the lower level. Of course, that's the FMR B38 uh, guideline. And then the flag is 936, which is two times that 438. So if you put in anything for indirect costs that exceeds the 936, it's going to flag. Or if it's less than 10% of that 9, uh, the 438, it's going to flag. And so does that mean that the data won't go in? Uh, no, it's not. It means that you're going to have to get in there. You're going to have to clear it and explain why uh, the delta difference is either higher or lower. But this is just an example. Okay, uh, activity-based costing. Okay, B38 versus ABC. And again, if you remember uh, earlier in the day, or earlier in the briefing, I talked about activity-based costing, and I said, really, that's where you want to be going. Uh, B38 is a stopgap measure, uh, but at the end of the day, hopefully you have an FMIS that enables you to do activity-based costing. Of course, B38 provides guidance so that direct costs aren't ignored. So you have something to put in there. It treats all indirect costs as fixed costs. It manages uh, the cost of managing motor vehicles are underrepresented in the cost competitiveness of life cycle cost analysis. In other words, the indirect cost for an older vehicle, say something that's in your fleet that's 10, 12, 14 years old, it costs more indirect costs to manage that vehicle than it does a newer vehicle. And, of course, that's one of the things I'm sure that uh, most of you understand, that newer the vehicle, the less management it takes to operate, the less maintenance, the less a lot of different things. Uh, for activity-based costing, or ABC, it places indirect markups on labor parts and fuel where appropriate. It treats most indirect costs as variable uh, direct costs. It, uh, the cost of managing older vehicles are accurately represented in the cost competitiveness and life cycle analysis. And, of course, when we talk about life cycle cost analysis, we're talking about the total cost from the time you receive that vehicle until you dispose of that vehicle to include the disposal proceeds as, as the total cost of owning that vehicle. Now, what are the benefits of conducting an ABC analysis? Well, first off, uh, you determine the re uh, reasonableness or the competitiveness of your fleet management costs. You determine whether or not and how costs can be reduced if they're not reasonable. So in other words, as you're sitting here and you're looking at your fleet, uh, you may take a look at one aspect of it if you're an agency level or department level fleet manager, and you may ask them why my fleet in Georgia costs me more to operate than the fleet in South Carolina. And so it gives you that level of detail. <clears throat> uh, by changing, uh, you might change it by fleet management uh, practices. Uh, by changing fleet resource uh, consumption practices, uh, provide a foundation for establishing internal costs or chargeback rates for working capital funds. Now, there's only a handful of working capital funds within the federal government, but uh, hopefully, in the years to come, there'll be congressional approval where most fleets will have a cost or chargeback rate that they can charge for the use of their vehicles. And what that means is, excuse me, instead of uh, folks requesting vehicles and just getting the vehicles that they want, uh, they're actually going to have a budget that they're going to have to do, and they're going to have to pay to get the vehicles. And the uh, chargeback rates right now are used uh, by the Forest Service. Uh, they're used by uh, GSA Fleet, uh, the FAS side of the house. Uh, when you pay for your vehicles, they're GSA Fleet leased. That's a chargeback rate. Uh, they're used uh, State Department. Uh, they're in downtown in D.C. They have a chargeback, a working capital fund for their vehicles. And there's probably a couple more out there that I'm not familiar with. Uh, it enables you to assess the benefits of outsourcing or insourcing certain fleet asset management activities. So in other words, if you've got an in-shop maintenance facility 
if you're doing activity-based costing, you'll know exactly what it's costing for that mechanic or for the equipment to maintain it, and you may make a decision or your organization may make a decision to either keep that in-house or to outsource it. What are the key steps in an ABC analysis process? Well, first, you assume that you already have identified direct and indirect annual costs associated with managing and operating the fleet. And again, we talked about those previously. Next, you define the fleet management activities which costs will be calculated. And, and again, this is where you need to develop these buckets. You need to identify which buckets are the costs going in and what are they related to. Uh, you're going to allocate the costs, the cost pools, which are the buckets I'm talking about, associated with each activity. Uh, you're going to estimate the annual consumption of resources. So you only have so much money. Where is all this money going? Is there something you can get in and manage? You can convert the annual costs to unit costs uh, for performing of each activity. So each one of the buckets is an activity that's associated to that fleet. And so what you're going to do is you're going to convert those annual costs to the unit costs for, for performing each of those. And then you're going to take a look and you're going to say, are these costs reasonable? What's the reasonable of this cost? Okay, let's define the fleet management activities. First, you got to manage, you got to manage the asset life cycle. And a life cycle of a vehicle, for those of you who've done the CFFS training, or the Certified Federal Fleet uh, Specialist Training, you know it's the acquisition of the vehicle, the operation, the utilization, and the disposal. That is your life cycle of a motor vehicle. Furnish in-house maintenance and repair labor. Furnish in-house maintenance and repair parts. Uh, you may procure outsource maintenance and repair and uh, procure supply fuel. That's some of the activities. Uh, you can allocate costs to those activities. You can establish those cost pools that I was talking about or the buckets that I referred to for each fleet-related product or service which an annual cost can be calculated. And again, this has to do with your direct and indirect costs both ways. You're going to develop allocation methods and statistics for allocating uh, the cost to the pools. For example, just, just an example, fleet manager spends only a percentage of the time on each cost pool, and so you would split that cost accordingly. And you say, well, you know, what all is the fleet manager doing? Well, they're going to have oversight. They're going to do an acquisition of the vehicles. Uh, they may be ordering in fuel. They might be uh, overseeing the shop maintenance. Uh, they uh, might be looking at the training uh, for the mechanics in the shop, uh, possibly managing the administrative support staff. There's lots of different things that the fleet manager's time should be split upon. We're going to estimate the annual consumption of resources. Uh, you know, the months of asset ownership. How long have you had that vehicle? Uh, what are the in-house maintenance and repair labor hours? What is the cost of that maintenance and repair uh, in-house parts? And again, it's back to capture all the direct and indirect costs. The cost of outsourced are sublet maintenance and repairs. Uh, not all shops are all things. In other words, not all vehicles have the total realm of maintenance that's done in the shop. Many shops outsource their body, their paint, uh, engine overhauls, transmission overhauls, so they do component change out, but they don't necessarily do uh, that level of work. Okay, and then of course, uh, consumption of gallons of fuel. How much fuel are you going through? <clears throat> Okay, let's calculate the uh, unit cost, uh, and this is just an example. Uh, well, 1.9 million is the total cost in a year of employing and supporting the mechanic workforce of 15. So basically what that's saying is you have 15 folks on the floor as mechanics, and it's costing 1.9, and that is the total cost of employing them and, and supporting them. That, that includes their overhead. Uh, 21,000 is the total number, or 2,000. 100 is what it should be, or 21,000 is the total number of hours of in-house mechanic labor projected to be charged to the work orders in year X. And so you got 1.9 million for total labor, and then 21,000 hours is how many hours that they can work. And of course, uh, the fully loaded cost per year per mechanic is $90.47. And that's one of the things that we at Mercury, when we're out looking at uh, federal sites, commercial, state, uh, local government, doesn't matter. 
oftentimes we go into a shop where they're uh, performing all their maintenance in-house. And so we ask them, well, what is your labor hour? What is your labor rate for the shop? Many times they'll come in and say, well, it's $45, $65, or something on that line. And oftentimes, by the time we finish doing the calculations, it's either double or triple what they're estimating. And what they're not doing is they're not capturing all their direct and indirect costs. In other words, a fully loaded rate of having that mechanic in that shop. And so that's why you have to be very careful with that. And how can activity-based cost analysis improve fleet uh, maintenance and repair practices? Well, consider an organization that thinks it's in-house cost uh, technical labor, $65 an hour. This is exactly what I was talking about on the previous slide, and the analysis reveals it's at 115. How would you or other stakeholders in your organization react to such a finding? Would you think it makes more sense to outsource? Uh, or would you think it makes more sense to lease? We're talking about leasing, and that would be a GSA fleet lease vehicle. And as you all know, that is what's considered a wet lease, where the fuel and maintenance is included in lease cost. Uh, now, some of you may have maintenance shops at your facility. You might have contracts set up with the GSA fleet lease folks, uh, where you do the repair for the GSA vehicles, and that is fine. Uh, but uh, if you don't, uh, this is something we'll take a look at. So if you have a shop, if you have not done a real activity-based costing analysis to determine what is your overhead rates, then that is something you need to be focusing on. Okay, activity-based cost uh, analysis is a recap. Uh, we got to understand the unit cost of your fleet maintenance and repair act Activities is essential to managing and ensuring a reasonable normalization can effectively manage uh, fleet costs that it can't see. So again, it's all about identifying all those costs, uh, developing those buckets where they should be, and gaining that visibility. Uh, any organization can manage fleet-related expenditures, but this is not the same thing as managing the fleet costs. So you need to know all the costs. Uh, many police don't generate regular invoices or receipts that can be retrieved from the financial department system for compilation of analysis. And uh, so uh, what that amounts to is uh, a lot of times there's work that's being done, say, in the shop for a vehicle or possibly a driver that goes and picks somebody up, and they're transporting people, but they're not generating any type of work order or receipt for that. And determining fleet operating costs begins with the development of an annual uh, fleet operating budget. And if you don't currently have one, creating one either within or outside your organization's financial system, you need to do it. And I know you do your A11, you have a budget that goes in. Uh, very few of you probably get funded to the level of what the A11 says. Uh, you typically get, uh, with the cost of inflation, what you had last year unless you've had a significant mission change and additional revenues or budgets that come in. All right, well, that concludes uh, the briefing. I think I'm a little bit ahead of schedule here by about 10 minutes.